So we've got some uh, some wonderful folks here today. I want to acknowledge a few of them. First of all, our outstanding governor, Mark Dayton. Yeah. Your wonderful senators, Al Frank and the Navy Club of Char. Correspondence office, and every night uh, the folks who manage the correspondence office select ten letters for me to read. And the, the job of these letters is not to just puff me up. So it's not like they only send me letters saying, "Mr. President, you're doing great." <laughs> uh, sometimes the letters say, "Thank you for something I may have done." Sometimes the letters say. You are an idiot <laughs> and the worst president ever. And most of the stories, though, uh, are stories of hardship or hard-won success or hopes that haven't been met yet. Some appreciate a position that I may have taken. Uh, some disagree with, uh, with what I'm doing. Uh, some consider policies like the Affordable Care Act to be socialism. Uh, some uh, tell stories about the difference uh, that same policy may have made in folks' lives. 
So, so I'm hearing a good sample of, of what's happening around the country. And last month, three young girls wrote um, to me that boys aren't fair because they don't pass the ball in gym class. So <laughs> there, there's a wide spectrum. And I, I'm going to prepare an executive order on, on that. <laughs> But the letter that Rebecca sent stood out. First of all, because she's a good writer, and, and, and also because she's a good person. And the story that she told me reminded Michelle and I of some of our own experiences when we were you know, Rebecca and her husband's age. And in many ways, her story for the past five years is our story. It's the American story. Okay. Early 2009, Rebecca and Ben, her husband, they were newly married, expecting their first son, uh, Jack. She was waiting tables, he was in construction. Like millions of middle class families uh, who got hammered by the Great Recession, the worst recession since the Great Depression, uh, life was about to get pretty hard. If only we had known, she wrote, what was about to happen to the housing and construction market. Ben's business dried up, but as a new husband and dad, he did what he had to do. So he took whatever jobs he could, even if it forced him to be away from his family for days at a time. Rebecca realized she needed to think about how uh, her career would unfold. So she took out student loans and enrolled in St. Paul College and retrained for a new career as an accountant. And it's been a long, hard road for them. They had to pay off debt, they had to sacrifice for their kids and for one another. But then last year they were able to buy their first home. And they've got a second son. And they love where they work. And Ben's new job lets them to be home for dinner each night. And so, so what Rebecca wrote was, it's amazing what you can bounce back from when you have to. We're a strong, tight-knit family who's made it through some very, very hard times. And that describes the American thing. We too are a strong, tight-knit family who has made it through some very, very hard times. And today, over the past 51 months, our businesses have created 9.4 million new jobs. Our housing market's rebounding. Our auto industry's booming. Our manufacturing sector is adding jobs for the first time since the 1990s. We made our tax code fair. We cut our deficits by more than half. More than 8 million Americans have signed up for private insurance plans through the Affordable Care Act. So here in Minnesota, you can now say that the women are strong, the men are good looking. The children above average and 95% of you are insured. And it's thanks to the hard work of citizens like Rebecca and Ben and so many of you that we've come farther, we've recovered faster than just about any other advanced economy on earth. More and more companies are deciding that uh, the world's number one place to create jobs and invest is once again the United States of America. That's the good news. And you don't hear it very often. By every economic measure, we are better off now than we were when I took office. You, you, you wouldn't know it, but we are. We've made some enormous strides. But that's not the end of the story. We have more work to do. It wasn't the end of Rebecca's story. Because she went on to write in her letter, we did everything right. The truth is, in America, where two people have done everything they can to succeed and fight back from the brink of financial ruin through job loss and retraining and kids and credit card debts that are set up to keep you impoverished forever and the discipline to stop spending any money on yourselves or take a vacation in five years, 
it's virtually impossible to live a simple, middle-class life. That's what Rebecca wrote. Because their income is eaten up by child care for Jack and Henry. They cost more each month than their mortgage. And as I was telling Rebecca, Michelle and I, when we were uh, their age, we had good jobs and we still had to deal with child care issues and couldn't figure out how to some months make ends meet. They forego vacations so they can afford to pay off student loans and save for retirement. A, a, a big splurge, Rebecca wrote, is cable TV so we can follow our beloved Minnesota Wild and watch Team USA in the Olympics. <laughs> they go out once a week for pizza or burger, but, but they're, not, they're not splurging. And at the end of the month, things are tight. This is like this wonderful young couple with these wonderful kids who are really working hard. And, and, and the point is, all across this country, there are people just like that. All in, in this audience. You're working hard, you're doing everything right. You believe in the American dream. You're not trying to get fabulously wealthy. You just want a chance to build a decent life for yourselves and your families. But sometimes it feels like the odds are rigged against you. And I think sometimes uh, what it takes for somebody like Rebecca to sit down and write one of these letters. And I believe that even when it's heartbreaking and it's hard, every single one of those letters is by definition an act of hope. Because it's a hope that the system can listen. That somebody's going to hear you. That even when Washington sometimes seems tone deaf to what's going on in people's lives and around kitchen tables, that there's going to be somebody who's going to stand up for you and your family. And that's why I came here, because I want to let Rebecca know. And I want to let all of you know that, because you don't see it on TV sometimes. It's not what the press and the pundits talk about. I'm here to tell you, uh, I'm listening, because you're the reason I ran for president. Because those stories are stories I've lived. The same way that when I saw those young teenage moms, I thought of my mother. And when I see Rebecca and Ben, I think of our struggles when Malia and Sasha were young. And, and they're not distant from me. And everything we do, I ran for president because I believe this country is at its best when we're all in it together and when everybody has a fair shot and everybody's doing their fair share. And, and the reason I believe that is because that's how I came here. That's how I got here. That's how Michelle and I were able to succeed. And I haven't forgotten. And so even though you may not read about it or see it on TV all the time, our agenda, what we're fighting for every day, is designed not to solve every problem, but to help just a little bit. To create more good jobs that pay good wages. Jobs in manufacturing and construction, energy and innovation. That's why we're fighting to train more workers to fill those jobs. That's why we're fighting to guarantee every child a world-class education including early childhood education and better child care. That's why we're fighting to make sure hard work pays off, the wage you can live on, and savings you can retire on, and making sure that women get paid the same as men for the same job, and folks have flexibility to look after a sick child or a sick parent. That's what we're fighting for. We're fighting so everybody has a chance. We're fighting to vindicate the idea that no matter who you are, or what you look like, or how you grew up, or who you love, or, 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 or who your parents were, or what your last name is, it doesn't matter. America's a place where if you're doing the right thing, like, like Ben and Rebecca are, and you're being responsible, and you're taking care of your family, you can make it. And, and the, the fact is, we can do that. If we do the some basic things. If we make some basic changes, 
We can create more jobs and lift more incomes and strengthen the middle class. And that's what we should be doing. I know it drives you nuts that Washington isn't doing it. And it drives me nuts. And, and the reason, the reason it's not getting done is today even basic common sense ideas can't get through this Congress. No, I, and, and, and you know, sometimes I'm, I, uh, I'm supposed to be, you know, politic about how I say things, but I, I'm finding lately that uh, I just want to say what's on my mind. So, so let me. <laughs> so, so, so let, so, so, so let me just be clear. Think, think, I want you to think about this. So far this year, Republicans in Congress have blocked or voted down every single serious idea to strengthen the middle class. Now, you may think I'm exaggerating. Let me go through the list. They've said no to raising the minimum wage. They've said no to fair pay. Some of them have denied that there's even a problem, that despite the fact that women are getting paid 77 cents for every dollar a man's getting paid. They've said no to extending unemployment insurance for more than 3 million Americans who are out there looking every single day for a new job, despite the fact that we know it would be good, not just for those families who are working hard to, to try to get back on their feet, but for the economy as a whole. Rather than invest in working families getting ahead, they actually voted to give another massive tax cut to the wealthiest Americans. They don't boo, by the, by the way. I want you to vote. But, <laughs> but, I mean, over and over again, they, they showed that they'll do anything to, to keep in place systems that really help folks at the top but don't help you. They don't seem to mind. And their obstruction is keeping a system that is rigged against <coughs> families like Ben's and Rebecca's. I'm not saying these are all bad people. They're not. I, you know, when I'm sitting there just talking to them about family, we get along just fine. Um, many of them will acknowledge when I talk to them. Yeah, I know. I wish we could do something more. But... I can't, but 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 they, but they can't be too uh, friendly towards me because they'd be run out of time by the Tea Party. But sometimes I get a sense they just don't know what most folks are going through. They keep on offering a theory of the economy that's time and again failed for the middle class. They they think we should give more tax breaks to those at the top. They think we should invest less in things like education. They think we should let big banks and credit card companies and polluters and insurers do whatever is best for their bottom line without any responsibility to anybody else. They want to drastically reduce or get rid of the safety net for people trying to work their way into the middle class. And if we did all these things, they think the economy will thrive and jobs will prosper and everything will trickle down. And just because they believe it uh, doesn't mean that the rest of us should be believing. Because we, we tried what they're handling and it doesn't work. We know from our history that our economy does not grow from the top down. It grows from the middle out. We do better when the middle class does better. We do better when workers are getting a decent salary. We do better when they got decent benefits. We do better when, when, when some. We, we, we do better when a young family knows that they can get ahead. And 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 we do better when people who are working hard know that they can count on decent childcare at an affordable cost. And that they, if they get sick, they're not going to lose their homes. We do better when, if somebody's stuck in a job that not, is not paying well enough, they know they can go get retrained without taking on huge mountains of debt. That's when, that's when things hum. And with just a few changes in priorities, we could get a lot of that done right now if Congress would actually just think about you and not about getting reelected, not, not about the next election, not about some media soundbite, but just focus on you. 
so, so that's that's why I've said it. I, look, I want to work with the Democrats and Republicans. My favorite president, by the way, is, is was the first Republican president, a guy named Abraham Lincoln. So, uh, so I'm not. This is not. Uh, this is not a statement about uh, partisanship. This this is a statement about America and what we're fighting for. I'm not, I'm not going to let gridlock and inaction and willful indifference and greed threaten the hard work of families like yours. And so we, we can't afford to wait for Congress right now. Uh, that's why I'm going ahead and moving ahead without them wherever I can. That's why I acted to raise more workers' wages by requiring federal contractors to pay their employees a fair wage of at least $10.10 .10 an hour. That's why I acted to help nearly 5 million Americans make student loan payments cap those payments uh, at 10 percent of their income. That's why I made sure more women had the protections they need to fight for a fair pay in the workplace. That's why we went ahead and launched new hubs to attract more high-tech manufacturing jobs to America. And now, some of you may have read, so we take these actions, and then now Republicans are mad at me for taking these actions. They're not doing anything, and then they're mad that I'm doing something. I'm not sure which of the things I've done they find most offensive, but they've decided they're going to sue me for doing my job. I, you know... I mean, I might, have, I might have said in, in the heat of the moment during one of these debates, uh, I want to raise the minimum wage, so sue me when I do. But I, I, didn't, I, didn't, think they were, I didn't think they were going to take it literally. <laughs> but giving, giving more work in America a fair shot is not about simply what I can do. It, it, it's about what we can do together. So... When Congress doesn't act, not only have I acted, I've also tried to rally others to help. Uh, I told CEOs and governors and mayors and state legislatures, for example, they don't have to wait for Congress to raise the minimum wage. Go ahead and raise your workers' wages right now. And since I first asked Congress to raise the minimum wage, 13 states and D.C. have raised theirs, including Minnesota, where more than 450,000. Gap raised wages for its employees. Job applications went up through the roof. It was good for business. I even got a letter from a proud mom right here in Minneapolis who just wanted me uh, to know that her son starts his employees at $15 an hour at Aaron's Green Cleaning here in town. There they are. So, The letter said, we are very proud of his people-centered business philosophy, three cheers for a decent living wage. So, so we don't have to wait for Congress to, to do some good stuff. On Monday, we held the first ever White House Summit on Working Families. And we heard uh, from a, a lot of other families like, uh, like Ben Rebecca. They count on policies like paid leave and workplace flexibility to juggle everything. We had business owners who came and told me they became more profitable when they made family life easier for their employees. So more companies are deciding that higher wages and workplace flexibility is good for business. Reduces turnover, more productive workers, more loyal workers. More cities and states are deciding this is good policy for families. So the only holdout, standing in the way of change for tens of millions of Americans, are some Republicans in Congress. Because so, I, I just want to be real blunt. If, if you watch the news, you just see, okay, Washington is a mess. And the basic attitude is everybody is just crazy up there. And, but if you actually read the fine print, it turns out that the things you care about, right now Democrats are promoting. And... And we're just not getting enough help. And my message to Republicans is join us. Get on board. 
if you're mad at me for helping people on my own, then why don't you join me and we'll do it together. We'll do it together. I'm happy to share the credit. mad at me for taking executive action to make it easier for women to find out if they're not getting treated fairly in the workplace. Let's do it together. You can share the credit. You're, you're worried about me trying to fix a broken immigration system? Let's hold hands and go ahead and make sure that this country continues to be a nation of law and a nation of immigrants. I, I want to work with you, but you got to give me something. you got to try to deliver something. talking about instead of trying to mess with me, <laughs> then, then we'd be doing a lot better. That's what makes this country great is when we're all working together. That's the American way. Now more than ever, with the 4th of July next week, Team USA moving on down to Brazil. <laughs> try to rally around some economic patriotism that says we, we rise or fall as one nation, one people. Let's, let's rally around the idea that instead of giving tax breaks for millionaires, let's give more tax breaks for working families to help pay for child care college. Instead of protecting companies that are shifting profits overseas to avoid paying their fair share, let's put people to work rebuilding our roads and our bridges and our airports. Let's invest in manufacturing startups so that we're creating good jobs making products here in America, here in Minnesota. Rather than stack the deck in favor of those who've already got an awful lot, let's help folks who have huge talent and potential and ingenuity but just need a little bit of a hand up so that we can tap the potential of every American. I mean, this, is, this isn't rocket science. So, you know, there, there's some things that are complicated. This, is, this isn't one of them. You know, let, let, let's, let's, let's make sure every four-year-old in America has access to high school, uh, high, high quality preschool. So that moms like Rebecca and, and dads like Ben know their kids are getting, are getting the best quality care and getting a head start on life. Now let's redesign our high schools to make sure that our kids are better prepared for the 21st century economy. Let's follow the lead of Senator Frank and Secretary Perez and get more apprenticeships to connect young people to rewarding careers. Let's tell every American if they've lost their job because it was shipped overseas, we're going to train you for an even better one. Let's rally around the, the, the patriotism that says our country's stronger when every American and count on affordable health insurance and Medicare and Social Security and women earn pay equal to their efforts and family can take as need if their kid gets sick and, then, and, and, and when nobody who works full time is living in poverty we can do all these things and so, so, so let me just let me wrap up by saying this um, I know sometimes Things get kind of discouraging, and and I know that uh, our politics looks profoundly broken, and, and Washington looks like it's never going to deliver for you. It seems like they're focused on everything but your concerns, um, and I know that when I was elected in 2008 and then re-elected in 2012, you know, so many of you were were hoping that we could get. Washington to work differently, and sometimes when I get stymied, you think, oh, 
Maybe not. Maybe it's just too tough. Maybe things won't change. And I get that frustration. The critics and the cynics in Washington, uh, you know, they've, they've written me off more times than I can count. But I'm here to tell you, don't get cynical. Despite all of the frustrations, America's making progress. Despite the unyielding opposition, there are families who have health insurance now who didn't have it before. And there are students in college who couldn't afford it before. And there are workers on the job who didn't have jobs before. And there are troops home with their families after serving tour after tour. Don't think that we're not making progress. So yeah, it's easy to be cynical. In fact, these days it's kind of trendy. Cynicism passes off for wisdom. <laughs> but cynicism doesn't doesn't liberate a continent. Cynicism doesn't build a transcontinental railroad. Cynicism doesn't send a man to the moon. Cynicism doesn't invent the internet. Cynicism doesn't give women the right to vote. Cynicism doesn't Make sure that people are treated equally, regardless of race. Cynicism is a choice. And hope is a better choice. And every day, I'm lucky to receive thousands of acts of hope. Every time somebody sits down and picks up a pen and writes to me and shares their story, just like Rebecca did. And Rebecca said in her letter, she ended it, she said, I'm pretty sure there's a silly thing to do to write a letter to the president. But on some level, I know that staying silent about what you see and what needs changing never makes any difference. So I'm writing to you to let you know what it's like for us out here in the middle of the country, and I hope you will listen. And I'm here because Rebecca wrote to me, and I want her to know I'm listening. I'm here as president because I want you all to know I'm listening. I ran for office to make sure that anybody who's working hard to meet their dreams has somebody in Washington that is listening. And I'm always going to keep listening. And I'm always going to keep fighting. And your cares and your concerns are my own. And your hopes for your kids and your grandkids are my own. And I'm always going to be working to restore the American dream for everybody who's willing to work for it. And I am not going to get cynical. I'm staying hopeful, and I hope you do too. Thank you. God bless you.